I'm so so happy right now. Means each and every uh, each and every speaker is just bringing up some amazing facets uh, as such from gravity to the walks with nature or the way we look at how you distill your to-do list or uh, learn from list or, or the life's lessons. That's pretty amazing. And once when we get that uh, image or let's say uh, the copy of that, uh, we will we will share you or it, uh, it will be we will send it to your emails as such. Uh, so uh, we. Uh, are still going to look forward for our fourth speaker. He already is here, uh, patiently waiting. Uh, not the last and not the least, it's Evan. Uh, I'm just going to be uh, so happy to uh, be talking and sharing and converse conversations with him. But before that, I was just trying to uh, look at things uh, of what, uh, thank you Evan for joining us and that's a nice artwork back there. Just, just hold on, uh, hold on uh, your, your thoughts about, about things. I want to just uh, talk about uh, the element which I had in my mind, essential. No, not that. Uh, this one. I think no matter what, we're always talking about the new normal, right? Means uh, I think means sometimes there are things happen and people forget uh, what they have learned when they're under under some umbrella or under some dark patch. Like a few years ago, we all went through the uh, let's say not the oil crisis, but we talked about. Uh, gas guzzling vehicles, but then uh, everybody thought we would go and buy on the small, tiny cars. It did not happen. We went back and bought big trucks, and that's 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 what it is. But I think uh, for the worst things to happen right now, we are losing sixty thousand people today in the U.S. only in the last one and a half month. It's a very sad thing to go, and uh, it is what it is. But at least now a pandemic like this will help us think uh, about the way we look or the way we should be looking and, and going forward, right? Means if we are not going to learn from this event, we will, we will never be able to learn, uh, learn as such. So there might be so many different elements. We already are cataloging, categorizing uh, some of the industries which will be uh, uh, seeing a decline. There will be some industries which will have a very short, uh, I would say, applying to. It will not just be the survival of the fittest. I think it will be the survival of the quickest of how you pivot to all the good things, all the responsible things, and all the essential things, uh, all the good things that we need to do. And, and no matter what, right now, we are seeing a phenomenal uh, elements of unemployment. Uh, but the thing is, uh, it also is, uh, uh, if you see, uh, as let's say, the two sides of the coin, it also would be a phenomenal increase in the entrepreneurship of what people want to do. No matter what, we always are thinking of some retirement plan, or if only I would have time, I would do this, or I have this idea, I never got time to do that. Many people are always on that edge. Means you talk with people, everybody has one or two ideas right there. So maybe uh, bad things are happening, I'm not discounting that, but this also might be the other element where we might see a new resurgence uh, of, of entrepreneurship models, of, of new startups happening, uh, of trying to solve local problems or maybe uh, global problems as such. So that resurgence is always there after a big event, good or bad. Like in the 70s, uh, just after the NASA was, fan, was formed and we had this amazing, I would say, uh, kind of an uh, project, uh, you know, all the Apollo 13s are to go up and down, uh, completely successful missions as such. What happened after that or during that means NASA outsourced everything to, uh, to the suppliers and there are so many suppliers, not just big, small, micro tiny uh, elements which really spurred here and there and everybody were together by a very positive cause right now is the other thing side right? the event is also as big as that not just usa specific for a space uh, i would say race but even i would say the entire world uh, is there in the same element means uh, we are all in this together we have heard that uh, a lot uh, right now we are apart uh, let's say social distancing but uh, mind wise we are still the, still the same uh, same elements as such so maybe if you want to see a certain i would say uh, uh, the elements that might come and happen after this would be uh, the rise of those kind of an entrepreneurship models uh, and we can see those kind of an actions already means we are design studio uh, we are still uh, open for business and we are still com completely doing it pretty efficiently actually uh, in this world but we are also seeing an uptick of, of people who have ideas now how to how to finance that uh, how to put uh, the sweat equity in that will always be one of the, one of the hurdles that will always be a hurdle for any startup or entrepreneurs but 
I think, uh, not just as a studio, but as, as a designer, as a person, now we can see a resurgence of those elements and hopefully all of them should be or eventually will be, will be for good. So, uh, uh, we are almost at the time to uh, make sure we uh, get Mr. Uh, Evan. Uh, Evan, you can, uh, sorry, uh, unmute and let's see your beautiful face right over there. Hello. How are you doing? I am doing great this afternoon. This has been really fun to listen to all you guys. This has been, uh, it, it, actually, when we did the first one of these, too, I had the same similar effect where, you know, I, I was kind of wrapped up in my own work, but having this, these other voices coming in really kind of brought the rest of the world in and made me feel like part of the world again, you know, so. That's, that's pretty amazing. And before we go in, tell me something about the artwork behind you. Oh, um, that's actually a series of, um, well, one in a series of Mandela's that I did um, a number of years did ago. You did that? I did that, yeah. Um, wow. I actually did that when um, we found out we were pregnant with our first child. So it's, it's a meditation, which is what a Mandela is. You know, it's, it's not meant to be representational in any sense. It's really more about just what you're thinking and feeling and how that comes out in the artwork as you do it. So... I was, you know, ruminating on the process of uh, a child growing and, and you know, going from a, a cluster of cells to a little human being, you know. I thought I knew you, uh, I knew you, but I don't know some of the other aspects of what you've been doing. And even you said there's a series of those? Yeah, there's uh, three of them uh, that are completed and I've got a, a bunch of others that I like topics that I want to do, but I haven't, I haven't touched them for a while. So you have three kids? Maybe I'll get time since I'm home. <laughs> you have three kids or? Uh, no, well, no, I have two kids. The, the other <laughs> are, are on different. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. It's being recorded, okay? So don't say anything that might, uh, that might you should not say. Uh, but that's pretty interesting. So uh, tell me something. Uh, right now, how are you keeping yourself inspired? What are the newer things you are, I would say, uh, finding about yourself in this amazing five weeks of uh, lockdown that we are in? Well, this, this whole thing kind of hit me at a funny point in my life. Because um, just a couple of weeks before the virus kind of showed up on the world stage, I, I turned 50 years old. So I was already in a little bit of a pensive state of mind, you know. Um, and I think this virus has really kind of kicked that into high gear. You know, I... Um, I find myself really focusing a lot on the simple things that we have to do every day. You know, like uh, I really, you know, that you know, I've been a, an enthusiastic cook, you know, most of my life, but you know, there's something about when it's the main thing that you do for one of your recreation elements, you know, when you're stuck at home that turns it into something more, you know, um, it's, it's, I find myself, myself focusing on the nurturing aspects of it, you know, that, you know, we're trying to be really mindful about the resources that we have in our pantry and how to make the best use of those and, and create, you know, really good meals at the same time that everybody will enjoy. And, um, you know, there's just something very soulful about that, you know. Yeah, I think our participants need to know, means apart from you being an expert uh, in industrial design and more than that, a specialist in the world of uh, GUI uh, and, uh, and HMI, uh, you also uh, restore vehicles and cars. Uh, you do that as a pretty big hobby. Uh, you obviously uh, are a gifted uh, artist too, apart from design. But what I think our party participants need to know is, Evan is an amazing chef. Means anybody can be a cook like me, but uh, Evan is really a chef. And he, I think as far as uh, 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 the things that you are doing over there must be pretty interesting. So one day we should get together and try to see what you learn through these weeks and upping your game in the world of uh, world of cooking things, except chili, I would say. That's the element where you are lacking pretty <laughs> strongly, I should say that. Uh, but everything else, I think I should learn from you. Okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah, I, I had to do that, right, Mills? Yeah, yeah, well, I got you this year. You got me last year. So. Yes, yes, let, let, let's, let's see about that. So, uh, so I think uh, you have uh, as, uh, some of your, uh, I would say, uh, uh, expertise to share uh, share your screen we can go through that and then we will save time for Q&A also okay sounds good okay so um, I'm gonna start today uh, with you know essentially what I want to talk about is um, UI and UX and the idea of uh, engagement and how important that that really is um, you know Everybody that does product development of every type knows that engagement matters, but there's a number that I want to show everybody here that um, 
is actually, it's, it's really striking. It's 2,450,000,000 is a very important number. Um, and being locked up at home, everybody should be a little bit aware of the significance of this number because this is the number of active monthly users of Facebook in 2019. Um, I'm really dying to see the, the uh, active number of, of users right now because <laughs> yeah. I have to believe it's gone up significantly. Um, so what that kind of means, you know, if you, if you look at other social media, you know, that 2.4 billion users um, is a really, really large number. And it's, it's significantly larger than any others. Um, you know, if you look down at, at Pinterest, there are about 27 million uh, users, which is, you know, a lot of people, but proportionally, it, it's, it's, it's quite small relative to Facebook. Um, and I think the reason that, that Facebook is actually so popular is basically because they are all about engagement. Um, uh, their entire platform is basically built around the idea of just setting the stage for letting people engage with one another. Um, and the size that they've reached, I think, is, is just uh, reflective of uh, the value of, of that as a central tenet of, of what their product is. Um, so let's put that number in, in a couple of different perspectives here. So 2.45 billion, we're in a population right now in the world of 7.7 .7 billion, uh, which basically means that right now Facebook is at a 32% uh, global participation rate, um, which I don't think you can say that about just about any other thing. Um, well, you know, we have, uh, uh, forty percent of the population that, that lives in in, in democracies, uh, but the only other things that really kind of get to that level are things like religion and, and stuff like that. So um, engagement is is certainly uh, paying some dividends uh, in, on the Facebook side. I mean, in the last image, what was the VK stand? What does VK stand for? Maybe I'm missing. Sorry, it's not letting me go back. Oh, sorry. I completely disrupted your. What go. is the VK thing? The VK thing. On the right side of LinkedIn. Maybe it might be some other country they might be oh, using. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember. It's been a while since I put that, okay. that graphic together. Um, it might actually be a Chinese app. Yeah, it might be that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what it boils down to though is Russian app is called V Contact. It's a Russian app. Somebody just uh, answered it from the chat. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the cont contribution. That's great. Um, so basically, what it boils down to is every adult is spending an average of 2.25 hours a day um, on Facebook, and teens in all of social media, not just Facebook. There, you know, uh, are studies out there that say that they're putting in as much as nine hours a day. Um, so if you take those numbers, um, uh, 2.45 billion users times 136 minutes per day, you get this really amazing number, which is 333 billion, 200 million minutes per day uh, spent on Facebook. And if you take that out to a year, you wind up with a really crazy number, 121 trillion, 618 billion minutes per year of human attention spent on Facebook. So that's, to simplify that number, it's 231.4 billion years of human attention that are spent on Facebook every year. Um, so, you know, you can make a statement <laughs> that I think is fairly safe to say, based on that, that daily Facebook usage represents the single largest, fastest growing investment of human time and energy in a single entity in the history of the world. Um, that's my statement. Um, it's based purely on these numbers that I have, have shown you today. Uh, it, it's potentially, it could be wrong, but boy, I will stand by it based on the way that it's growing. Um, I, mean, and I mean, what the element over there is, they're still following the laws of social distancing. So it's sure. completely valid, completely legal, and they're still interacting. Yeah, yeah. So, so why am I showing you all these numbers? And it gets back to this basic statement that engagement matters, right? Um, and in engaging broadly, I think, is, is maybe even a better way to say that, you know, um, if you have a user base and you're developing personas for it, you can't, you know, create an ideal persona. Um, like if you were to sit down and think about Facebook, how on earth would you create a persona 
that represents the typical Facebook user when you've got 2.4 billion people that use the platform. It's impossible. You can't do it. Um, so I, I think that's actually a, you know, a, a, um, a frontier for design in the future is, is trying to figure out how to broaden who you appeal to um, and engage those people in meaningful ways. So I want to talk a little bit now about um, engagement itself. Because I think that engagement these days, in terms of the, the 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 language that we use around engagement, it really has become a catchphrase for good UI and good UX, um, or perhaps the other way. U, UI and UX have become a um, a way of rephrasing the word engagement. Um, so how do you go about maximizing engagement? So we need to talk a little bit about like the process of how people actually get engaged in an in, interface in or in a, in a user experience. Um, so I'm going to walk you through five steps, some time, and a little attention. <laughs> so this is, you know, I was trying to figure out how to actually sum this up, and it kind of came down to that little phrase, five steps, some time, and a little attention. I like it. Um, and, you know, the five steps basically come down to, you know, the increasing um, awareness and, and buy-in that a person has to any given situation. You know, it could be a product. Um, the services that are provided by a, a company, it could be um, an interface. Uh, so the first thing you have to have is awareness. Uh, so you have to have an entity that people can be aware of, right? Um, there are, you know, I wonder how many great ideas are floating around out there, but that never come to fruition because nobody takes the step to make a company around them, you know? Um, but awareness is really based on a, a on a on a mix of different things. You know, it's it, it's trends, it's things that are going on in the world, it's things that are brand that brands are doing and what they try to represent. It's about aesthetics, uh, what people value from an aesthetic standpoint. It's about reputation, um, and it's really kind of about you know the individual's field of view. You know, it really is what people are aware of. You know, in order to become aware of something, you have to be looking for something. Um, the next level is discovery. So once somebody has become aware of you, um, in order to become engaged, they have to discover something about you. You know, so there has to be something about uh, what you're doing or presenting in the world that that piques people's interest, that, that makes them curious about you, that makes you want to know more about what you've got going on. Um, the next level is ascribed value. So this is this is where people start to internalize what you're you're presenting to them you know because you know in, inevitably if they're going to commit to what you're you're offering they have to find some value in it um, so the process of ascribing value to that is basically that they are ascribing personal meaning to what you're, you're putting into these things if you um, go to buy a product um, most people don't buy things that they don't find some value in. You know, even if you're buying a candy bar, you still like um, chocolate or sugar or something like that. You know, but it's it's there's something within it that you ascribe a value to that um, leads to the decision to actually participate or to buy that that product or service. Um, participation is more an active engagement within that. So this is, you know, apart from saying, yeah, okay, there's a thing in there that, that I think is valuable and I might be able to use. Um, participation takes it to another level because you actually start to model cognitively um, how you're actually going to uh, use that thing. You know, going back to the example of a candy bar, since I mentioned it, how many of you right now are actually thinking that, boy, I really need a piece of chocolate right now. That would be great. Um, <laughs> um, so that, that's part of what happens is that, you know, in order to become engaged, you actually actually have to internalize uh, what you're seeing as a potential solution to a need. Okay. Um, now, stepping to the left side of this a little bit and, and kind of talking about uh, the development of UI and UX, um, this is actually where a lot of the work that we do to create a product actually comes from. You know, it's about organization, consistency, and functionality. Um, because the needs that people internally you know, bring to a, a situation need to be reflected in the product. So um, in terms of engagement, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of design work and, and attention that needs to go into this level of what a product is all about. Um, it's about defining the product and how it actually meets people's needs. 
Um, moving up from that, you get to the commitment stage. So if you've inter modeled um, internally what the benefits of this thing are going to be, um, thought about how you're going to uh, live with it and what you're going to do with it, um, and have found that to be um, adequate, uh, you make a, a commitment to that. And to me, that, that basically means the design has been competent at this point. Um, you've, you've gotten somebody to the point where they've, they've reached an inflection point of going from thinking about getting the thing to actually getting the thing and engaging with it. Um, so important thing to realize here is that engagement has been building all along. You know, it starts very small with just awareness and then you build up to this point at which you make a commitment to it. Um, this is just the midpoint of engagement though. I mean, the, the thing that, that most, a lot of people don't realize is that once you get past that point, you're really at the beginning of the relationship uh, between the person that, that is gonna take advantage of that thing and uh, the company that's producing it. You know, because now you're entering into the realm of emotion. You know, once you've committed to a thing, now it's about what you do with that thing and what your relationship with that actual thing is. Um, so it opens up a whole new range of, of interactions here. You know, you talk about trust and loyalty and love and nurturing and things that, you know, are really emotional reactions to what a person feels about a per particular service or interaction. Now, the tricky thing about emotion is that, you know, it doesn't begin at the commitment point. It actually begins all the way back at awareness. And this is where aesthetics, you know, kind of really kind of matter. Um, because they help you form some of those early uh, assumptions about what a product or service actually is all about. Um, and the consistency of those things, you know, as you move toward the commitment point, um, actually is, is really important in terms of solidifying the way that people emotionally feel about that purchase decision. Um, so that's the tricky part. You know, you can get somebody to the point where they find a value and they commit to it, but um, the emotional part actually starts way down at the very bottom of it. So it kind of has to grow along with these things. Um, now the coolest part, and this is, you know, again, we, we use Facebook as an example, um, primarily because of this, um, is that the next step is agency. And this is, you know, we've done our five steps, awareness, discovery, ascribed value, participation, and commitment. Those are the steps that a manufacturer, manufacturer or a, a publisher of an app or um, a service provider, they do those five steps. Um, the sixth step, agency, is all on the user. And it's where a lot of the benefit actually comes from. Um, because once you've committed to something and you start to use it, then you have the agency to do with it what you want to do. Um, and the conclusions that you draw are based on that usage. Um, so as a manufacturer, the thing that, that behooves you is to watch what people do with your product, right? Um, and see how they become engaged because it becomes um, fuel for how to uh, meet that next awareness point and be able to think about the next product or the next improvement to your product. Um, so it does become cyclical, cyclical in that sense. Um, but this upper part is, is all in, in the, on the part of the user to do this. Um, and Facebook is maybe the best example I can possibly think of for this because they basically set the table for people to do um, any kind of interaction they want to do. Um, and then they've unleashed, you know, all of this interaction in the world, a cat saying hi, um, <laughs> uh, that, that is kind of unique and remarkable in, in its scale um, in the history of, of human endeavor, really. Um, so now I want to switch, switch uh, 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 gears here a little bit because I want to just talk about like, like if, if you were going to sit down and do any of this process and wanted to create a UI or UX. Yeah, you, yeah did you back? Uh, one uh, on the back slide. I just have a question. Sure. So that, that's, first of all, it's a beautiful kind of an explanation of the chart. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty deep uh, uh, and maybe we... Uh, there's so many things and nuggets over here. When we say ascribed value, uh, is that from the client's point of view where they're ascribing a value to a product versus the other perspective of how people are going to, uh, let's say, read the value? Who is ascribing the value, the maker or the, or the, or the consumer? Well, this, this chart is actually put together kind of um, from the user's point of view. Okay. 
you know, so this is more about, you know, the, the company has put something out and, and you're discovering it. In order to commit to it, you have to ascribe some value to the things that you're finding in it. Um, so, I mean, the, the task of the, the manufacturer or whoever is making this thing, whether, regardless of what it is, whether it's an interface or a product, um, is to actually meet those needs, you know. So, um, you know, one of the things I think is really useful when you're developing a product is to actually walk yourself through this process. You know, when you think about um, how to develop a product, you know, think about, you know, what a person's first impression of it is going to be. Um, and then think again about like, how are they going to find value in this? And then think again about, well, how are they going to participate with it and commit to it? Um, and then once they've done that, what's going to happen? You know, so I mean, I think of this as, as kind of a way to, um, it's almost a short, shorthand for the design process in a way. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Man. But it over, it's overlaid on top of, you know, you know, how do people actually, you know, become involved with a particular product or an interface? Um, and I think it's just an interesting way to look at it. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. So the next thing I want to do is, you know, if, you know, I, I also teach uh, uh, interface design uh, at the College for Creative Studies. And um, one of the things that I'm always tasked with is, you know, I have, uh, you know, brilliant students that come to me every year that have amazing skills and, and tons of creativity. But a lot of them have not done user interface or user experience before. Um, so what I have to boil it down to for them a lot of times is, okay, well, like, what guidelines can I give you? <laughs> you so, know? Evan, Evan, can you also take a moment uh, in telling more about yourself? Because Evan is not just a uh, designer sure. for us. Evan also uh, volunteers his time and puts his time to teach uh, students at CCS, right, Evan? And yes, been, that's uh, correct. For a long time. Yeah, I've taught there, uh, let's see, this is 2020. So I've taught there now for 23 years, part-time. Um, and I've taught a, different, a variety of different classes. You know, I started out teaching um, just drawing and rendering courses in the industrial design program. I've taught uh, studio uh, courses in industrial design. Uh, currently, I'm teaching in the, the master's program there, um, teaching uh, the, the fundamentals of user interface design. Um, and it's really interesting. You know, the, the thing that's remarkable about the MFA program is that the students there are different than they are uh, in the undergrad. In the, in, the, in the undergrad, most of them are coming in from high school and, you know, they're artistically talented, creative, brilliant, little, you know, kids. Um, the master students come in a lot of times from other disciplines entirely. You know, I've had uh, uh, people with backgrounds in marketing, I've had civil engineers, I've had all, all, all different people from all different walks of life that have come into this. So um, their task when they come in and they want to learn, a, learn you know, interface design is they have to get oriented to the task first. Um, so uh, this part of the presentation is really kind of boiled, a way for me to kind of boil down an approach to that. And I think it really relates to what I just talked about in terms of engagement, because each one of these 10 rules um, has uh, a particular hook in it that relates to engagement. Um, so if you can follow these 10 rules, you know, in, in this process, when you're over here doing organization consistency, functionality, and, you know, meeting needs, um, you know, you've, you've got a good start on those things. So this is just a, a quick look at that. Um, so rule number one is solve the right problem, you know, and uh, I have to credit Jacob Nielsen of the Nielsen Norman group. Uh, he's been doing UI and UX really in a formal way longer than anybody, basically. He's like the grandfather of the industry. Um, and his statement is, you know, even the best designers produce successful products only if their designs solve the right problems. A wonderful interface to the wrong features will fail. Um, so this gets right to the heart of the engagement problem. You know, if you're solving the, the wrong problem brilliantly, you're still not doing something that's going to be successful. So, you know, consumer research, uh, observational research, design research, um, those are all uh, things that are super important to helping you understand, you know, how to define what it is that you need to do. Um, so that's rule number one. Uh, rule number two is to use frameworks to understand patterns in the proper context. 
Um, a lot of people are, are confused by the word frameworks, and it's, it's a thing that's really kind of unique to UI design uh, in particular. Um, and basically what it means is, it, I, I actually use the word context for it a lot, um, because it basically uh, pertains to um, the mindset that a user brings to any particular interaction. Um, you know, when you sit down to design an app, you know, you can't only consider what that person is going to do in that app. You have to consider their total experience and what they're bringing to that, that interaction. Um, and that's true of any product, whether you're doing a touch screen and trying to do, you know, controls on a, on a screen in a car, or if you're, you know, trying to design a physical product and organize its features and parts in a way that, that meets the needs of the user. Um, you have to understand those things in context. You can't just, you know, take a technologist point of view and say, I have Bluetooth, let's find an answer for that. You know, it's, it's much better to have a need that you're addressing and say, okay, Bluetooth is a, is a, offers a potential solution to that need. You know, that way you're, again, following rule number one, solve the right problem. Okay, uh, the next one, and this one is also super important for, um, uh, engagement is that consistency is encouraging. You know, one, one of the things that's really important whenever you're trying to get somebody involved with a product and to become passionate about it in particular is that um, they have to feel encouraged. You know, if, if at any point in, in, where they're be, when they're curious about it, if they feel discouraged, they're going to bail, they're going to leave. Um, so the more that you can, you know, kind of bolster their confidence, um, as they become more aware of and more interested in your product, um, the more encouraged they're going to be to actually complete that, you know, purchase of your product and, and begin using it and begin developing a relationship with it. Um, so a lot of that comes down to, you know, expectations, you know, and we, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, um, cognitive modeling, where, where people actually start to envision themselves using a product before they actually purchase it. Um, that's part of the expectations that people bring to a product. Um, so the more that those expectations prove right in the process of learning about your product before they even commit to it, um, the more likely they're going to be, be to become engaged with it. Um, use visual hierarchies. And this, this one, probably more than any other points, actually comes very directly out of the UI world because um, what you present in UI is, is literally um, it's a cognitive system that people have to orient themselves to and uh, uh, be able to engage with and, and understand. Uh, but it's really kind of true of any any aspect of a product. You know, even the the shape of a, a car. You know, you, it has an organization to it, um, the same way that um, the screen on on an app on a phone does. Um, uh, what it all adds to, though, is your ability to understand what that thing is and what it's all about. Um, so visual hierarchy is a way to uh, basically bring sense to that. Uh, what you're trying to do is say, this is the most important thing. This is the second most important thing. This is the third most important thing. So that when a person comes to that thing, they already have preconceived um, in their own mind how they're going to interact with it. Um, so again, this is about meeting expectations um, based on the way that you set the thing up. I mean, I like that. I, I like that end of your quote, uh, making a logic out of noise. That's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty heavy. I like it. There is so much noise out there, and how you react to the right signal, and make sure you understand how to differentiate between the right signals to react to versus yeah. making sure the other is really a noise. That's that's pretty. That itself will be pretty uh, huge. Uh, huge so, you know, it, it's funny. But, I don't think of myself as a great public speaker, but you know, as a teacher, you you find yourself saying things, and I, this is one I actually said in my class, and I had to literally sit down and write it down because I couldn't believe it came out of my mouth. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, so the next one, and this is another one of those comments, is that user interface or user experience is a conversation. You know, I'm using UI and UX here, you know, interchangeably because I, I think that they're they're two sides of the same coin. Um, but an interface is more than a collection of features and controls. It's an ongoing conversation about your product that, incurs, that occurs within the user's mind. You know, one of the things that is a fallacy about design is that we think that we design what the product looks like and, and, and um, how it's perceived. And, you know, this is basic, you know, philosophy. You know, 
you can uh, see a thing, but the, the perception of that thing actually happens in your mind, you know? So we can get into all kinds of, you know, conversations about what's real and what's not real. But um, essentially that's the thing that, that's important about this. You know, what a, what a consumer sees in your product affects what they think about your product. Yeah. Um, and in certain things, it's, you know, you kind of light and airy and, you know, you just have a, a, an emotional reaction to it and you feel good. You know, that's why people love cars, you know, because they're rolling sculptures, they're beautiful. Um, and you have a reaction to that. A UI is a different thing though, because, you know, you have to not only see a thing and have that, you know, beautiful reaction that you, you think it's attractive, but you also have to make use of that thing. You have to understand its structure. You have to understand what it's trying to tell you. Um, and you have to understand how to respond to it. Um, and what happens, you know, with any product is that over time, that internal perception that you have evolves. Um, so essentially what that comes down to is like every time that you use that object, um, you're having a conversation with the people that created that product. Um, you know, whether it gets back to them or not, you know, is, is more an embodiment of, you know, how, you know, they actually create the product. But um, every time that you enter into an inter interaction with a product, you're, you're basically conversing with the, the criteria that that company put together to put that object together. So the degree to which it meets your needs is really, you know, instructive, you know, to those companies about, you know, how they actually make their products. And even also, I think as we are going through, if you want to just go back, it might be the last one too. I think uh, most of it or some of these rules are not just for UI. I can see them Absolutely. applicable for the industrial design onset also, right? Or even applicable for the service design as Owen was saying in the, uh, in the early in the morning. So I know you are a, uh, a GUI expert and an industry designer, but this would stand its test uh, in the world of product uh, semantics too, correct? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think if you operated a food truck, <laughs> these would be good, good things for you to think about, you know, um, it doesn't matter what it is. I think these are all, these are relatively universal kind of things. So, yeah. um, next is to support and enable. Um, so the one thing that you can always count on with any product is that two things, one, people are going to make mistakes and number two, they're going to change their mind. Um, so good products, they actually embrace that, you know, and don't punish it, you know. Um, you know, I, th I think a great source of, of frustration with any product is when you think you can do one thing with it um, and then it, you can't e either can't do it or you, you change your mind and decide that you don't want to do it. If, it. if it punishes you for that, it's uh, a huge um, disincentive for continuing the use of that product. Um, however, if you have a product that's tolerant of those kind of things and it actually, um, you know, it, it allows people to, to interact with your product in, in flexible and, in, in, and non-restrictive ways, uh, that becomes a much more friendly and supportive kind of uh, relationship, you know. Um, so, you know, back buttons, like in, when you're doing a, a, user, a user interface, the back button is like one of the things that designers always, you know, want to ignore, like, because it's just visual noise a lot of times um, on the screen. But it's actually super important because, you know, if somebody gets down in the weeds of an interaction, and they decide that they, they want to not do that thing, or they want to go back and change something that they did three steps back. Um, if you if you don't give them that that opportunity or make it painful for them to do that, um, then it becomes a dissatisfaction for the whole interaction, not just that particular moment, right? Yeah. Um, the next one is there should always be more. Okay. Um, I actually love this one a lot because um, you have to you wrote it. Yes, I I, I do I do. I like this bias. It, it, it sounds like a nice uh, movie kind of an, a poster. And there's always, <laughs> there's always oh, more, yeah. a sequel coming in, a sequel, one more sequel coming in. I, I like it. Yeah, yeah. You should say it with more depthness. There should always be more. There should always be more. Yes. Yeah. I can't do that voice. Wait, my voice is going down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things that that is really true of, of all products is that, you know, there's the, the moment, there are certain moments that are really important, which are 
like the first, you know, unboxing experience and, and the, the moment when you first, um, you know, enter into the use of a product is, is always very poignant, you know, because, you know, you, you've made a decision, you've committed to something and now you've got the opportunity to have those needs fulfilled and it's, you know, very, you know, it's a, a fraught moment in, in, in that sense. Um, what a lot of people forget, though, is that a lot of products last really a long time. You know, when you buy a car now, it typically lasts about 10 years. Um, so you're going to see the evolution of that car over that time. Um, and when I'm teaching UI classes, I actually give the reference here of Photoshop, you know, because Photoshop is, is a software program that was built and originally released to the public way back in, I think, 1992. Um, and it's still a powerhouse in the industry. Um, the product that you see now that is Photoshop is not the same as the product that was released in 1992, though. Um, the beautiful thing about it is that it has continued to grow and evolve and change and get better um, year on year, sometimes month on month um, for that entire, you know, almost 30 years of, of its product life. Um, and to its credit, you know, I can sit down in Photoshop and I swear I can still learn something new every, every day that I sit down and, and use that, that software. Um, so that's really instructive, you know, about, you know, what the real nature of uh, the relationship uh, a product has and a company has with their consumers. Um, it's not a moment, it's a process, you know. So if you have a, a product that a consumer can still find value in, um, 30 years after they, they first started using it, you've done something really remarkable. Um, and it doesn't have to be 30 years. You know, if, if you have a product that only, whose life cycle is only two years, you know, it, it really is, is advantageous to think about, okay, well, at the end of that two years, what am I still getting, getting out of that? You know, is it new and different than the thing that I get out of it first? Um, or is it, you know, the same? Um, and I think the more you can make it grow and uh, deepen and become better over time, uh, the, the better chance you stand of maintaining that engagement. You know, especially if you've got, you've got products that do only have like a two year lifespan. You know, if you've got to replace that product in two years, you better hope that at the end of that two years that that consumer still has a positive view of, of your product. Um, so this idea of products that evolve, I, I think, is, is really cool and, and potentially another frontier, you know, for a lot of different products in the future. Um, every word matters, okay? Um, again, this comes out of UI a little bit because we always, it's not just graphics you put on a page, you have to put words in there too in order to instruct people into what to do. Um, so I love this quote, a picture can tell a thousand words, but a few words can change its story. You know, uh, the thing about words is that they carry meaning. And again, this gets back to the cognitive part of this, you know, the cognitive modeling of an interface that happens between your ears as opposed to what's on the screen. Um, because every word carries meaning with it that, you know, you think you know what it means, but somebody else might think something else about what that word means. So really concise language and being able to say exactly the thing that you need to say in order to get it across the meaning that has to be, that's essential to that interaction uh, is super important. So concise language, um, uh, whether it's in advertising or in the instructions on a, on a, a GUI screen uh, is super, super important. You know, if, if you don't trust a word, don't use it. Uh, that's another one of them. So. I like the way you, you use the elements of keeping things conversational and not yeah. sensational for the for the heck of it. So that's that's pretty deep actually because sometimes people just go by for this word bites and sound bites and uh, they don't know but in fact they are inflicting wounds on, on their own brand mm -hmm. by not correctly choosing the words that really matter. Yep, exactly. And we're all guilty of being lazy about that, whether we want to or not. You know, the thing that you can can never predict is the meaning that another person is going to ascribe to what you say, you know? Yeah. So, um, okay. Create elegant solutions. Now this one used to I actually modified this one. It used to, you know, say, keep it simple, you know, and I guess I have a lot of heartburn about that because yeah. 
simple is actually the hardest thing to do. <laughs> you know, um, most products have a degree of complication to them. And, you know, it, it's real easy just to say, we'll just make it simple, right? Um, but to me, that's not, as a designer, you know, that's not really the, the proper thing to say, you know, because what you really want is an elegant solution. What you want is something that is just exactly right for the thing that you're trying to do. And just making it simple may not actually be the thing that makes that happen. You know, um, we've done a fair amount of work in, in the medical industry. And I think this is always a great um, arena to think about this problem in because um, inherently anything that you do in the medical environment is backed up by, you know, huge amounts of information and technical constraints and, and things like that. Um, but ultimately you have to boil it down to something that, you know, becomes tab A into slot B kind of thing. Um, so that people can understand it, they can react to it, they can make use of it in a moment. Uh, they don't have to stand there and think about it really hard. Um, so what's really important there is an elegant solution. You know, you have to provide a context that makes sense. You have to um, provide uh, outputs that, are the, that also make sense. Um, you know, and just simplifying those things to, you know, uh, for the sake of simplification, really um, short changes, you know, all of that, that um, context that surrounds that thing. Um, so, again, th this is the thing that, you know, it's a, it's a catchphrase, keep it simple, stupid, right? Um, I think create elegant solutions is a much more appropriate thing to say for a lot of those things. I, I think... Um, uh, I mean, not just that, of all the people, I think you might explain it very better, the element of differentiation between simplicity and not being the opposite of complex, complex and complicated. If you want to, I mean, it's not just semantics, but the way I think you use the, uh, the meaning of understanding what is complex versus complicated, that might help the participants understand what simple simplicity sure. means. Can you spend some time on that? Yeah, sure, sure. So, I mean, there, there is a difference between uh, complexity um, and complication. Um, like the thing that I always reference here is, is like your desk at work or, or like the desk where you do your bills at home. Um, most people, they, they separate all of their different documents into piles and um, to a random observer, a lot of that just looks like a mess, right? You know, um, but the reason that it looks like a mess is because you're not the one who made the piles. You know, you're, you're, you're the one who's trying to observe and make sense of what's there, but the person that actually created those piles of paper and organ, created that system of organization is the one that really understands it. You know, so even though all those piles are um, very complex, um, to the person that actually organized them, it's actually the simplest way to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is different for the person that's trying to observe that quote unquote messy desk is that they don't have the key to it. So to them, it's complicated because they don't have the understanding of why one thing relates to another or why one thing is placed in one place and another thing is placed in another place. So without that key to understand it, they're faced with only the complexity of that system of organization. Uh, whereas the person that, that, knows why they put things there you know they understand it perfectly and even though it's complex it's not complicated for them um this is something i learned from my wife <laughs> i hope she'll that she'll forgive me you know for saying this but you know um, one of the things about getting married is that you're suddenly uh intimately confronted with another person's system of organization <laughs> um and uh, it, it very quickly gets you to the point where you uh, understand the difference between complication and, and complexity because, you know, the, the thing that is the difference between the two is this key to understanding, right? Um, so I, hopefully that, it, that explains a little bit about, you know, creating our elegant solutions, you know, because it's, it's about content. The metaphor of the, of the desk uh, it itself uh, changes the point of view of how we look at, uh, look at the key elements of complexity versus, uh, I would say, uh, complicatedness. But well, it, it, also gets, it also gets to the point why designers can't fully trust themselves all the time. You know, if you create a design and you never show it, you know, to anyone and ask them what they think of it, you're probably going to make mistakes that are exactly this kind of problem, you know, where 
you've created a system of organization and a system of aesthetics and a system of, of communication around a product um, that makes sense to you as the designer, but you know, ultimately the person it needs to make sense to is the user. You know, so you know, that's a trap for designers. If you, if you create a design and never test it, um, don't be surprised if you know you create some things that you know don't resonate with people. You know, yep. makes sense. Um, number ten is that innovation is never finished. You know, at its heart, every product design, every UI is a collection of ideas, and ideas are never static. You know, you know, product tooling and 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 interface graphics are static in the sense that you know you have to set something down in order to actually make something that you can sell. Um, but, you know, because people have a long, have long-term relationships with products, you know, innovation can never stand still, you know, just because you did a thing and it's successful doesn't necessarily mean that you're done. Um, it means that you just have good footing for making the next innovation. Um, you know, a lot of companies, they, they engage with us and they, they, it's for a project, but what I wish they would do is to engage with us, um, as uh, a resource for ongoing innovation. You know, I think that's a, a, a great way to think about what you have to do um, long-term with any company and with any series of products that you're gonna do. Um, so that gets me to my last, last thing, which is not really a rule, but it's, it's in more of an axiom and the, <laughs> that's that rules are made to be broken. Um, as much as I've tried to codify like the basics of, of how to put together an engaging UI with this, the one thing that, that I, I always know is that there will be things that will happen that um, for whatever reason they work. And, you know, you can use these rules to maybe decode some of those things, but at the end of the day, if it works, you shouldn't question that. And you should, you should trust your gut and go with it. You know, because I think that, you know, situation awareness in, in any development environment is hugely important. You know, um, you can have a lot of things that are telling you this is the right thing to do. But if your gut is telling you something different, you know, you can use these tools to kind of break down why your gut is telling you that. Um, but there's usually some sense to it. You know, so it, it bears, you know, uh, due consideration. Uh, uh, when something is is working, uh, to to not question that. So I like that rules are made to be broken. Means I think uh, Mark Twain also said uh, the similar things about like practice moderation, even moderation. So we have to it's just understanding. You understand everything else, and you still be brave enough to break some of them. Uh, by the way, I like that 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 GF yep. over there. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I, I think it means I know we are on the top of the time, but I then I think there are a couple of questions. Uh, at least some of the smaller yeah. ones. when we talk about sorry, go ahead. No, you're okay. Uh, when we talk about uh, graphic user interface uh, as such, uh, and everybody uses an example of this, right? It means Jamie used that, Owen used that. It's a pretty pretty interesting uh, uh, artifact we have in the hand, but. Right now, the phone is central to many, many user experiences. How do you think mm -hmm. this, this artifact is going to evolve as we go into the future? Any, any comments about that? Yeah, actually, I think it's really interesting. I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable that the phone has become so central to so many different things that, that um, we all engage in on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's a remarkable product in the history of the world in that regard. Um, and it's had a remarkable evolution, you know, since 2006 when the iPhone came out, you know, um, you know, it, it really has evolved quite a bit. The, the thing that we have to recognize, though, is that I honestly think it's fairly stagnant right now. You know, if you, if you look at what's going on with phones, you're seeing a lot of um, innovations in terms of cameras and, and things like that. But the, the great proliferation in terms of apps is kind of slowed down a little bit, you know? Um, so I think we almost have to look kind of at Moore's law a little bit, which says that, you know, every six months, you know, you know, transistors will, will basically double. Um, and I think that, you know, we, you know, from a technological standpoint are kind of coming to the point where that trend is slowing down. Um, and I don't know that it will stop, but I think the focus of it is going to change and that's going to change the character of phones. Um, because I think what it means is that you're going to find phones that now are more specialized. 
you know, so you're going to find uh, phones that are um, essentially designed to be connectors. You know, I, I honestly think that, you know, they stand the best chance of uh, creating the kind of user profiles that so many, you know, companies are thinking about right now so that they can engage and have uh, a relationship with a client on an ongoing basis. You know, um, you know, when you, you consider, you know, that people can switch quickly between digital products, um, that bit of them that they take with them becomes really important, you know, because, you know, if you can enter into a relationship and know something about that client immediately and be able to react to that immediately, um, then that is a tremendous advantage. Um, and I think phones, you know, they're going to get better at that in the future. So that's, that's going to be the thing. That makes sense. Actually, that's what I think, uh, Jimmy was, uh, uh, trying to think about how the phone can be connected between somebody having a math problem over here and somebody can be over there, that kind of an passageway. That's a pretty interesting way and connect, connecting with what we heard from other speakers. Trying to connect to uh, the first speaker, Owen, and we talked about service design and there are so many other manifestations of it. When you talk about service, some of the models that you interact with, uh, the revenue model becomes a subscription model as such. So just talking about user experiences, moving into the subscription slash service models, how do you think that might affect the consumer expectations or experiences in the future? I'm sorry, you kind of broke up a little bit there, Jiva. Could you go back? So we talked about, we talked in the morning, we talked about, uh, or during lunchtime, uh, service design. And one of the elements in service design is uh, the revenue model happens to be subscription based model. So, talking mm -hmm. about UI or GUI of a normal, uh, let's say, one has to one design versus moving over to a subscription model. How, how the immediate future might be changing or should it change? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that we're still in, in the, um, the ramp up phase of subscription services. Um, the whole thing about subscription services, there was a real core value at the beginning of them was that they could bring you a full range of media and things like that um, at a lower cost, you know, you know, I'll hold up, you know, Netflix as an example there, you know, where people had been paying, you know, large amounts of money for cable bundles, you know, to get the range of content that they wanted. And then along comes Netflix and says, hey, for seven bucks a month, you can get all of this content. Um, and it's a great thing. But now look what's happening. Now you've got HBO, you've got Disney, you've got all these other companies that are, that are trying to do the same thing. And if you sign up for all of them, you're back to almost the same point that you were with the cable bundle, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we do run the, the risk here of, um, you know, poisoning the well a little bit. <laughs> you know, by nature of the prol proliferation of it, you start to lose some of the original value. Um, and these products are becoming more mature too. So, you know, originally when Netflix came out, you could have, met, you know, Disney movies on, on Netflix. Now you can't do that. So there's, there's silos that are starting to appear. So essentially that market, you know, we're, we're in, in a, a place where it's not really mature yet. Um, so where's it going to go in the future? I, I think it's, it's interesting, you know, that this prolif proliferation seems to, you know, still be happening. Um, we do have to kind of ask the question though, because we are, you know, basically saying that people are walking away from ownership now too, you know, instead of buying a movie, you're just renting it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what are the ultimate benefits of that? And I think, well, actually, what are the ramifications of that? I guess is the thing. Um, so, you know, Netflix and, and things like that, that's one, one part of this. But when you get into like software subscriptions and things that you actually use to do things, um, the potential downsides of losing access to those uh, become much greater. You know, uh, in the past, you bought software for your computer and you use that to do things and to provide things to people, right? Um, in the future, if that software is based on a... Um, a subscription model and you lose your job, you've, you know, suddenly lost, you know, the financial ability to pay for those services now. Um, so the potential is, you know, the software that you had before and you had already paid for and had, you know, access to it in perpetuity. Um, if it's a payment, a monthly payment model, that could go away more easily. So the, the potential impacts of that could be greater down the road. Yes, that's pretty interesting and I think we should be try to respectful of the time uh, as such so 
trying to bring at least uh, this section to an and any 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 I means I I love your 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 top ten uh, kind of an uh, commandments uh, for the world of UI, which can be very easily uh, transferred back to the world of ID, the world of service design, the world of business design. Uh, so thanks really for that. And uh, I know I, as with every speaker or, or every VDC, time will always be uh, kind of a limitation as such. But uh, just to close it up, can you can you give? I Means you have a pretty nice kind of an uh, balance from from being a, a professional in, a, in the independent design studio, Silver uh, Ferrar itself, uh, a teacher, uh, uh, and the world of UI. Any any passing wisdom to uh, share? With, with the upcoming uh, next generation of designers that made you who you are? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I would say to any uh, up and coming designer is just be curious. You know, I, I think we all have ideas about what we want to do as designers or product, developer, product developers of any type. Um, and the world is going to throw you curveballs. <laughs> you know, oh this is the biggest black swan curveball yes, we are we, we are in a unique period of time right now um and i think the thing that that is you know most essential in any of those moments is, is to remain curious and and be open to the the questions that you know um your course in life um opens up to you on a daily basis you know there are projects i've worked in you know we did a project on rope a few years ago and when you when you think about um rope you think you understand it right um but i'll tell you having to sit down and focus on rope you know for the the duration of a three-month project i learned more about what i think about rope and what the possibilities for rope are than i ever thought that i would see um so that's a surprising thing and and you know um you know, maybe it's a useful anecdote, but you know, I, I think it's a good model for the a way to approach your professional life too. Is just you have to stay open and, and, and inquisitive. You know, it, it really is 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 a life skill that you just cannot do without. Yep, I, I you 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 said it. It's 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 essential. It again, <laughs> Every time. make sure we're always open and open for learning uh, as such. Yep. And I think uh, that echoed throughout throughout Jamie's presentation, John's uh, and Owen's also, if we are, we're always there, we're always curious, trying to uh, understand how to learn from that context and then how to connect the, the needed points together. So thanks again uh, for the presentation uh, and the discussion and uh, trying to wrap up the entire program. Uh, thank you again for all the speakers. Uh, I, I, I think all of you are still uh, are listening to it. So. Uh, Owen, John, Jamie, Evan, uh, it was great to have you. I think uh, we are just getting some nice, amazing feedback uh, from from uh, from the participants as such. It was great to have some uh, amazing diversity from gravity till education till UI, uh, service design and aspects of it. Uh, this is what makes uh, the virtual design conversations, the conversations, understanding different facets and trying to see what connects with each other. Uh, thanks for all the questions coming in. Uh, I think Lanea will also send uh, the link to the recordings. We will try to split them up uh, as much as we can into four different sections. Uh, uh, it depends on where uh, whether what I speak in between might be at the end of something or start of something. Let's see how we can do that. But uh, we also are planning our next one. Uh, Michigan is still going to be under a lockdown uh, till uh, next May 15. So uh, before that, we also have the newer element uh, that uh, Lanea is passing around, and that's the tonight show. Uh, it's it's an audacious uh, kind of an uh, brave uh, kind of an element that we are thinking of pulling it out. Uh, it's basically random musings, observations, uh, curiosity igniters of how industrial design happens, how industrial designers might be thinking behind the background. Means I think we all kind of eventually understand what designers do. But what are those inspirational elements and how, what we do, how I think, as, as Evan was saying, how you look at it, how you ascribe the value to it versus what might be the ad, ideal value from consumer perspective or the maker's perspective or just a uh, third person perspective would be pretty interesting. So we are, we are hosting that. The first one was pretty impressive. Means, uh, again, not because I was doing it, but we got some good response back from it. So we will be doing it. Feel free to drop in questions when you register uh, and just uh, be there and we will we will definitely have some fun the main thing is fun and then a little bit of inspiration and education uh, let's try to see how we do that i saw some questions here yeah this is still g work i know this is the first time i am seeing myself 
uh, in the beard but with this amazing distinguished uh, kind of a gray hair coming into uh, but no i'm still jeevak i'm not his twin brother or somebody else but again uh, some all good things have come to uh, have somehow come to uh, should come to an end uh, we will pause over here uh, feel free to give us feedback of any other uh, i would say industry uh, speaker you want uh, to listen with or engage with uh, we are covering uh, as much as we can a broad perspective of whom we can uh, we can uh, get uh, we already have some of them finalized for the next one that will be uh, the last week of next month uh, and that's pretty interesting kind of a mix uh, you will receive and link uh, to it eventually uh, but if you uh, think you want to suggest some speaker uh, which might bring some amazing uh, highlights from a different uh, branch of the industry we would love to consider that so keep on suggesting and keep on uh, braving through this uh, covid thingy uh, it is uh, what it is but i think we will all come out on the other end a little bit more uh, better a little bit more beautiful a little bit more of our thoughts rearranged we have this amazing time to really think and uh, take stock of what we have done and now what we should do so having said that thank you uh, laneya let me know if at all we need to add something if not uh, i think uh, we should be good to go and thanks for all your comments it it, it it's it's it makes us uh, it makes me feel alive uh, uh of of what we do at, at, in in our day job uh, by the way as as a day job uh, we are full uh, alive and working we are doing some amazing things the team uh, that i am working with at sunbrook for our is just amazing you know, this remote collaboration is working it's it's unbelievable uh but somehow we just are put through it we all of us and it's working so anything that we can help with as a studio let us know anything i can help personally let me know till that time enjoy and go around the block uh, you we all sat for 4 hours we all need some physical exercise everybody owes at least 2 or 3 miles of run today thank you sir thank you girls thank you ladies everybody over and out